back to the channel. I've been on vacation and I so appreciate you coming back for another Bible study on the prophetic layer of scripture. And today we're going to take a look at Luke chapter 7. And there's about seven verses we're going to study here. And what we're going to find out is in Luke chapter 7 verses 36 through 46, God is contrasting two different people's hearts after they realize they've missed the pre-trib rapture of the bride. And in this passage, Jesus explains to a Pharisee named Simon why they were left behind and what is required in order to receive the reward of the Revelation 12:5 rapture of the man-child, which happens at mid-trib. Because as we've learned here, Revelation chapter 11 and 12 are layered upon each other. They're happening simultaneously. They are very clearly mid-trib uh, chapters. So I'm just gonna read these seven verses to you, and then we're gonna go back, and we're going to pick them apart, and I'm gonna try and do it rather quickly, but I'm gonna leave a lot of fruit hanging so that you have something to go back and discover on your own when you study this out further. So Luke chapter seven, verse 36, and I'm studying from the New American Standard today. Now one of the Pharisees was requesting him to dine with him, and he entered the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. And there was a woman in the city who was a sinner. And when she learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster vial of perfume. And standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and kept wiping them with the hair of her head and kissing his feet and anointing them with perfume. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man is a prophet, he would know who and what sort of person this woman is who is touching him, that she is a sinner. Verse 44, turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house, you gave me no water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but she, since the time I came in, has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she anointed my feet with perfume. Okay, this passage here is jam-packed with astounding insight that if we'll just take the time and look at the passage prophetically, we're going to learn some incredible things that are helpful for us who are wanting to be a partaker and receive the reward of that pre-trib rapture of the bride. We see in Luke 7, 36, the Pharisee was requesting, and when you study that word out in the Greek, it means interrogating, continuously asking. Well, the very next verse, verse 37, and there was a woman in the city who was a sinner. So God is connecting the woman with the city. And the reason why he is connecting her with the city is because God is letting us know she's not the bride because there's a difference between the bride and the church. There's a difference between the bride and the city, which is the new Jerusalem. Because you see, people who miss the pre-trib rapture of the bride are not necessarily unsaved. Many who miss the rapture will be saved Christians. And it says here that when she learned, he was reclining at the table. Well, when we studied that word learned, oh my goodness, it means in the Greek, to know upon some mark. That is, to recognize, to acknowledge, to perceive. Well, we know that after the bride goes up at pre-trib, the two witnesses are going to start ministering in Jerusalem standing before the rulers and calling them out and saying, you know, this is not our king, this person you are in a, an agreement with. We also know that 144,000 Jews are going to be marked, sealed, anointed. They are going to minister every one of them like the Apostle Paul because the book of Acts is prophetic. It's going to happen again. And those 144,000 Jews, they cannot be killed. However, they're going to have a lot of difficulties and tribulations during that first half of the seven-year tribulation. So isn't it interesting? It says here that um, when she learned, and that means to know upon a mark. 
So she knows he's reclining at the table in Simon the Pharisee's house, and so she brought an alabaster vial of perfume. Verse 38, and standing behind him at his feet, because he's reclining at the table. So I want you to see this scene. Picture what's going on here. She is crying. Now imagine culturally, even back, back then, this was very peculiar. Let's say you are, you are having a dinner party, you leave the door unlocked because guests are trickling in and you're greeting them. And, and back then you would you know, give them water for their feet, you would give them a kiss, a greeting. Even today, we kiss each other, we hug each other in a greeting. Well, so she comes into this dinner party, stands behind Jesus, singles him out, and she is weeping so much so that tears are falling from her face and landing on Christ's feet. And she kept wiping. So now she's bending down. She's bowing down. She's wiping his feet with her hair that now is let down and kissing his feet and anointing them with perfume. So she's very active here. Can you imagine the other guests? They're just looking at this whole scene. Well... Verse 39, when the Pharisees who had invited him saw this, so they, they're watching this. So when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who and what sort of person this woman is who is touching him, that she is a sinner. All right, there is, this is jam-packed. We see that the woman who represents the left behind church, as does Simon the Pharisee, left behind church. Jesus is, is, is in his house. She's been reading the seven letters to the left behind church. And what is what are those for? Those are a call to repent. So she's been repenting and reflecting back on her sins and she is crying about it. But now here's another people group being represented. There's going to be some Christians who are, why was I left behind? And the, judging people in perhaps even the home church. Because we understand earlier in this chapter, we recognize that the third temple will have been built. So when you go back and read chapter 7, you'll pick up on this. So they're not meeting at the temple. They're meeting in home churches, just like the book of Acts. And what is interesting here is... This Pharisee does not recognize Jesus as a prophet. Well, the pre-trib raptured bride certainly recognizes Jesus as the prophet. Uh, we see that because we know the woman at the well represents the pre-trib raptured bride when she leaves her stone water pot. Well, in John 4, 19, she says, the woman at the well says to Jesus, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. So see, when you recognize he is a prophet, oh, he reveals himself to you powerfully. Deuteronomy 18, 15, Moses says, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your countrymen. You shall listen to him. We recognize Jesus as a prophet. We begin studying the gospels and his ministry, his actions, where he's going, who he's saying things to, why, when, what order, we begin studying him as the prophet sent to us from the Father to teach us Bible prophecy. And this is a very clear mistake we see that the church is not engaged in. They may read the book of Revelation and our Christian leaders may talk about the book of Revelation. They might go in order, chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, not ever realizing that the book of Revelation is not written in chronological order. But studying prophecy is far more than just studying the book of Revelation. It is studying the whole Bible, pulling out the verses and asking the Holy Spirit to show us how is this verse, how is this chapter prophetic? When on God's seven-year timeline is this going to happen? So that's what this channel here does. And so I appreciate having a group of people to study with because you are you're adding so many wonderful insights to our studies in the comment section. We appreciate that. So here is the Pharisee. He's not firmly established 
that Jesus is the prophet that Moses talked about. But yet we see that the woman who came in weeping, who's associated with the city, the New Jerusalem, she, God already has her marked for that mid-trib rapture of the Revelation 12.5 man-child. The man-child, those who are mature along with those who are humble, teachable, not as mature maybe in the scriptures, but they are seeking God. So we notice here that God already has her pegged for being in that mid-trib rapture. But the Pharisee, he needs some instructions here because God is seeking to instruct the left behind church. Imagine when you're gone, the grace and love of God is gonna go to your left behind loved ones and they're gonna start reading the Bible like never before, like this woman who came into Jesus weeping. They're going to read the letters to the churches, which are letters written to the left behind church. You can tell there's so many clues in those letters of where they land on God's seven year timeline, Daniel's 70th week. Now we see Jesus, he's going to begin instructing Simon the Pharisee in a very loving way and in the way that he's going to instruct our left behind loved ones. Verse 44, turning toward the woman He's going to be looking towards the woman because now she's kind of eye level. Turning toward the woman, he says to Simon, do you see this woman? Well, now what's interesting about that is, in verse 39, it says, now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, saw this scene, so Jesus is trying to get Simon to see her with spiritual eyes, with a new attitude, a new heart. So Jesus says, do you see this woman? And he says to Simon, I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. Okay, I want you to stop and think for a minute. Why would Jesus want water for his feet? He is the living water. He is the word of God. He is the one at the Last Supper filled a basin with water and he washed the feet of his disciples, symbolic of washing their walk, their life in the word of God and teaching them that this is how they must help each other from then on out because he was gonna be gone. So as we study the word and we learn these insights, we go to our loved ones, we, we prepare our Bible study messages and we are not only first washing our own feet through what we are learning, but then once we've applied the word to our own life, we want to, out of love, wash the feet of our brethren. So why does Jesus want water for his feet? He does not need his walk cleansed. He's not a sinner. Oh, what is this water he wants? He's talking about a different kind of water that he wants, because now we're gonna start learning the three things that Jesus wants. We've discussed many times in previous videos the three things the Father wants. But now we're gonna take a look at the three things Jesus wants. And this is so important for us also, those who, of us who want to receive the reward of that pre-trib rapture. We're getting clues here about what Jesus wants. Jesus says to Simon, you gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. So we learn Jesus wants us to weep over our sins. As we give ourselves time each day, because every day we are, we're sinning. You know, we're human. We come into events, we're critical of people, we're jealous of people, we covet things, um, we're, we're vain. And we look at these as, oh, just a normal part of life, and we forget that, oh yes, we need to repent of that, and ask the Holy Spirit to help us overcome our jealousy, our bitterness, being critical of other people, people we love. We don't wanna be critical of them in our hearts. We don't wanna be coveting things that they might have that we wish we had. We don't wanna be like that because we're all so blessed. And so we wanna give ourselves time each day, and you might think of this as a burden, and it kind of is, you all admit, it's not easy. My flesh does not like to do this. My flesh does not want to take the time to reflect over my sins at, at the end of the day and ask the Lord, how, how have I sinned against you? And he lovingly corrects me. And I get, to, I get that opportunity to seek his forgiveness, ask for what I need, to be filled with the spirit of gratitude, well, even to ask for the spirit of repentance. And this gives me an opportunity to 
take the time and actually become sorrowful over my sin and often there are tears involved that's the water that Jesus wants for his feet it's our tears that we recognize we're sinners we are sorrowful we don't like those sins in our life we want to overcome them we're not going to justify them by saying oh well at least I'm not like this person and oh I'm not that bad verse 45 Jesus said you gave me no kiss but she since the time I came in has not ceased to kiss my feet she is expressing this intimacy and gratitude without embarrassment. Obviously, she was outclassed. You know, and I don't mean that in a negative way, uh, but we recognize that there are people that are fancier than us, that we feel more intimidated by when we are in their presence, uh, that we would not want to humble ourselves and be embarrassed we would not want to embarrass ourselves in front of particular people groups and often that's our own church our own church folk our own you know christian friends you know we don't don't want to uh, come across as being too in love with jesus because you know that's what brand new christians do mm. we want to be sophisticated <laughs> well so this second thing that jesus wants is intimacy with him expressing that without embarrassment, you know, whether, even if we're home alone um, or amongst our families, but especially when among our, our peers, whether they're saved or unsaved. So this is the second thing Jesus wants. All right, verse 46, what is the third thing? Jesus said, you did not anoint my head with oil, but she anointed my feet with perfume. So the third thing Jesus wants is, he wants us to give him our best. Or per perhaps it's our first, that speaks of the tithe. Or, you know, we've just been given something. He wants us to give a portion of that to him or to those who are in need. Uh, perhaps it's our only one. We only have one of these. And someone is in need of that. And we're confronted with, there's a need, I only have one of these. Give that. Perhaps it's our last one. We'll never get another one. We don't have it in stock. We don't have it in inventory. But he wants us to give him something that cost us something. And this perfume cost her something. We don't know what her uh, income level was, but it cost her something and it smelled good. To Jesus it smelled good to everybody in the room yet they're not noticing this they are judging this woman okay Heidi brought in when we were talking about this passage Psalm 23 5 you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies you have anointed my head with oil my cup overflows this is what it, the father is doing for Jesus not that he was in the presence of his enemies However, there were dark spirits that were oppressing Simon the Pharisee. And clearly the Father is blessing Jesus at the table as he is dining with them. You know, also, our team here connected verse 46 with the oil needed for the ten virgins' lamps. Because you see, those ten maidens, those ten virgins, they're not the bride. The bride went up pre-trib. These are ten virgins waiting for the mid-trib rapture, the church. Uh, you could call them the attendants of the bridegroom. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they're called the children of the bride chamber. In Revelation 12, 5, they're called the man-child. So this oil that the woman who came in weeping, the oil she has represents the oil that these 10 virgins are going to need because they are anticipating the mid-trib rapture. I just want to kind of wrap this up now and share with how does this apply to us? Well, Luke 7, chapter 7, verses 36 through 46 is a prophecy that runs a cycle. Prophecy runs a circuit. The bride is currently learning from the prophecies now. We recognize Jesus as the prophet that the Father has sent to us personally to teach us Bible prophecy. 
And so we are in preparation for the pre-trib rapture of the bride. The church as a whole, the mainstream evangelicals, they are not studying prophecy from the prophet Jesus Christ. They recognize him as their lamb, that's wonderful, as God, that's wonderful, as the Messiah, as their redeemer, kinsman, brother, the branch, the lawgiver, but they're, if they understood he is the prophet, they would be more intently studying Christ's ministry and everything he was doing every day for three and a half years. So since they are not studying Bible prophecy and the prophetic layer of all the scriptures, the entire Bible, they don't know how to be preparing themselves as the bride of Christ the way that they should be preparing because they don't know what their ministry is going to be once they're in their glorified, raptured body. You know, we've studied that here. We know, in part, a very healthy chunk of what we're going to be doing in our raptured body. We know what a raptured, glorified body is, and by studying Christ's body on Resurrection Day, we get a really good indication of what our raptured body is going to be and what it's for by studying what he did on Resurrection Day, but they're not preparing themselves for that ministry. They think they're going to be raptured at pre-trib, then immediately walk down the aisle uh, where Jesus is waiting for them at the end, and then they think they're going to take off for a seven-year honeymoon in paradise, being oblivious to what's going on for those seven years on earth. So the sleepy church is not thinking about serving desperate people, the left behind church during that seven year tribulation. Mm. Now, the good news is, and God's grace towards them and his mercy and his wonderful provision for them, yet they will have to experience a little bit of heat that will mature them for that first three and a half years. But once they are left behind, they will study the prophecies in order to see why they weren't raptured. So like Simon the Pharisee, they will be interrogating Jesus, praying for him, you know, reveal to me, you know, come and dine with me. So they will then begin studying the scriptures like we have been studying the scriptures. They will repent and weep the tears which provides Jesus with the water for his feet that he wants. They will serve him in a way that will cost them something, perhaps even their lives through martyrdom, knowing they're going to be resurrected as the church, as the man-child, as the rod of iron who will rule and reign with Christ. They will then begin preparing themselves to be the city because they will come to know there are three raptures pre-trib rapture of the bride, mid-trib rapture of the church, who go up, get glorified eternal bodies, and they will recognize there's a sideways rapture of the remnant who remain in mortal bodies, who are protected in the barn at the end of the age while the tares are being burned. Luke chapter 7 verses 36 through 46 are prophetic instructions which cycle through again going to the remnant that I just mentioned. We see here where Simon, whose name means hearing, and isn't it interesting, those seven letters written to the churches in Revelation, they keep pressing into the people to repent, and those who have ears to hear must hear. So isn't it interesting, this Pharisee's name is Simon. So he's going to receive that public reprimand. It might be kind of embarrassing mm -hmm, to be left behind, but they're going to be instructed through it. So the left behind church will become the heavenly new Jerusalem at their mid-trib resurrection and rapture, and the Jewish remnant will become the earthly new Jerusalem during Christ's millennial reign, because they will remain in their mortal bodies. So you see, they will be instructed by these passages also, because the word of God is eternal, and prophecy runs a circuit. Okay, thank you so much for watching to the end of the video, and I hope you enjoyed this study, and that as you go back and read the passage, the entire chapter, that you will get so much more that we didn't have time to put in this lesson, and we'll talk to you later. Bye!